All right, biblical living or practical theology, whatever you want to call it, Christian living, ordinary Christianity, it's all the same thing, is a new series that we started last week. I see the video of that is already online on our YouTube channel, so you can go find it there. It's an it's a introduction to all the different topics we're going to cover for the next few months, and then at some point we'll kind of just stop and get back to systematic theology and alternate between the two a little bit because they are so tightly interwoven. What I want to do today is start with some of the basic Christian disciplines as they have traditionally been called. Christian disciplines include things like reading your Bible and prayer and um, coming to church, uh, evangelism, things like that. And the first one that we should probably start with as far as a practical theology class is the issue of true worship. What is true worship? Uh, speaking to one of you uh, just before the service even, coming from a, a, a different church context, and the issue was always what's permitted in worship and what's not permitted and what can we do and what can't we do, and there's so many options, so many ways to worship, and some of them are better than others, and I had to sift through it all, and he says, no, there's only two ways to worship, acceptably or unacceptably. <laughs> And, and, and there's a bit of refreshment in that kind of clarity. Uh, do, don't discuss on how worship affects different peoples and cultures. Discuss what God says about worship. And so today, we're going to talk about worshiping truly. Uh, I wanted to make it active, so not true worship. It is worship truly. Okay? Worship is an activity that we participate in and that we're engaged in all the time. And this, by the way, is not going to be a class on the music at church. Okay, so if you have pet peeves about our music, speak to Trayton personally afterwards. That's not what this is about. Worship is not merely a reference to the singing at church. Worship is in everything you do. In fact, the majority of your worship is not done at church. The majority of your worship is not done to a musical tune. And that's what we're going to look at today. What is true worship? If we believe these wonderful true things about God and Scripture and Christ and the Holy Spirit and church and all these terrible things about mankind and the wonderful things about end times, we're going to have to worship. We're going to have to respond to it. Practically then, how do we respond to it? Because sitting on a pole somewhere and meditating to break a Guinness World Record is not worship in a biblical sense. It's false worship. Likewise, just running out of here with no impact of, the, of doctrine on your life, uh, well, you can't exactly call that worship either. Okay, that's atheism. <laughs> and so what is true worship? And we'll talk about that today. What is true worship? Now, before we get to true worship, we have to talk about the prerequisite for worship. The prerequisite for worship, and then we'll look at the practice of worship. So turn with me to John chapter 4. <clears throat> John chapter 4, um, one of my two favorite passages on worship. The other one is Psalm 99, which we'll end with. We'll turn to the Gospel of John chapter 4. If you remember John 4, it is Jesus speaking to Samaritan women. Okay, remember that, by the way, John 3 and John 4. John 3 is Jesus sharing the gospel with Nicodemus, a religious expert. And chapter 4 is Jesus sharing the gospel with a Samaritan who doesn't even know the Bible and is living, a, obviously, a moral life. So you have those two passages you can turn to, depending on who you're talking to, to share the gospel with them. John 4 is Jesus speaking to a biblically illiterate woman who thinks she knows what the Bible says, mind you. <laughs> Obviously, um, a moral lifestyle, nothing secret there, unfortunately. Jesus shares the gospel with her, and listen to what he says in verse 22 and following. Jesus is speaking to her and says, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. That's perhaps the most profound statement there. We are talking about practical theology. You know things, systematic theology that we've been studying. You increase in your knowledge of God and mankind and Scripture and all that stuff every day as you read the Bible. 
does that knowledge inform your practical worship or is your practical worship actually completely disconnected from that knowledge? She was worshiping. The Samaritans were very, very religious, very worshiping, worshiping the God of the Old Testament even. But Jesus exposes her false religion and says, you worship something you know nothing about. You claim to worship a God you don't even know who he is. That's false worship. We, referring to the Jews though, worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. If you want to get saved, you have to go to the Jews to find the truth, obviously. The Old Testament. But the hour is coming and is now here where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeking such people to worship him. So Jesus points to his own arrival on earth and says, since I came, the Jew-Samaritan distinction of worship isn't anymore a distinction between where do you worship. Remember, that was the preceding discussion. Samaritans say you worship on this mountain. Jews say, no, it's the mountain in Jerusalem where you ought to worship. He says, no, that's not how it works. True worship is never defined by the location. In Old Testament, you had to worship at the temple. That was where you would worship truly, but it wasn't the definition of true worship. What is the definition of true worship? If to worship in spirit... So it's who you are and how you worship in your own human being, not the rituals you do. And you must worship in truth, knowledge. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. A prerequisite for you to worship God truly this week is knowledge. You have to worship what you know. If you're worshiping in a certain way this week, you're living your life in worship to God, but you, it's completely disconnected from what you know to be true about God, then you're a false worshiper. You're worshiping in ignorance. Your knowledge might be great, but it's not connected to your worship, your life, your behavior. And we're, going to have to, we're going to see everything you do in life, everything your physical body even does, is worship. It's supposed to be worship. So, everything you do in life, everything your physical body even is going to uh, perform in the next six days, must be linked to knowledge of God. Knowledge about what you're doing based on God's revelation on that topic. You need knowledge to worship. And that is why, for example, one of the practical worship elements that come out of it in missions is Missions includes a large proportion of Bible translation. <laughs> yeah, the Great Commission doesn't say, go make disciples translating the Bible into their language. Why then is Bible translation such a big deal in missions? Because it pits the knowledge of God right in their hands so they can read it themselves. That's why it's always a core part of missions. That is why knowledge should always be a big deal in us and how we act. In fact, I'll challenge you. Take any act that you committed this last week, anything, pick one, good, bad, doesn't matter, and ask yourself what knowledge made me do that. And if it's a good act, you'll probably be able to link it to some scripture verses. If it's a bad act, you'll probably be able to link it to an ignoring of some scripture verses. You need knowledge. Now, here it's, it equates the knowledge later with the word truth, and you see that much clearer in Psalm 145. Turn there. One of those great majestic psalms, along with like Psalm 19 and Psalm 1 and Psalm 103. This one is, is much loved, well known. It's got a great line in verse 18. Well, a great line in every verse really, but we'll look at the one in verse 18. And again, this is a, a worship verse. A verse that even makes it onto many flowery backgrounds and sent out on social media. But listen to actually what it says. It's a rather exclusive verse, not as inclusive as people make it out to be. Psalm 145, verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him. That's a worship verse, right? You call out to the Lord, that's worship. To all who call on him in truth. The Lord is near to all who call on them. That's wonderfully true. And then he says, let's narrow, though, what we mean with all who call on them. 
all who call on him in truth, in true knowledge of who he really is. And it's found in Psalm 145, which is one of those psalms that includes that great self-revelation of God, of how He's merciful and gracious, slow to anger and rich in love. That's no accident. That's verse 8. Okay, to find verse 8 and 18 in the same psalm is no accident. This is a psalm that says, let's go and remind ourselves of the clearest declaration from God Himself to mankind, it happened to Moses, on what His character is like. Not all of Scripture that's God breathed, literally God showing up to Moses and the elders of Israel and saying, I quickly want to explain my character to you before we do anything else. The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, gracious and merciful. It includes that great knowledge of God that the people of Israel finally got. And then 10 verses later it says, God is close, near to all those who call on Him with that knowledge of who He is. A prerequisite for worship is knowledge of God, and to be very specific, true knowledge of God. What He actually says about Himself, not just what you think Him to be. Now, if you want to take that concept, it's still the same point. Knowledge and truth are the same thing. If you want to add another perspective on the same thing, it's not a, a third issue, on the same thing, you have to consider the concept of the fear of the Lord. And I keep forgetting who I was speaking to. I think it was a week ago, two weeks ago. We're talking about the fear of the Lord with somebody in fellowship and how few books you can find on that topic. Okay, it was David. Thank you. Okay, so I speak to David about it. He, was, he, he did the search. How few books you find on the fear of the Lord. And it's not that it's not discussed in Christian literature. It's just never advertised by that term. Okay, you get some great books on Christian worship. Okay, I used one of them in preparation for this. But they tend not to advertise on the front cover, this is a book about the fear of the Lord and all the practical ways of your life. They have titles like How to Worship God in Everyday Life. It's the same thing, though. And I think we need to restore the terminology, and I know David agrees with me, of the fear of the Lord when we think of worship. Because when I use the word worship, the fear of God is probably the last thing that comes to your mind, isn't it? So just use the word worship. If you show up at any group of Christians and say, let's worship and then tell people, quickly write down what you thought of when I said that. I won't be surprised that the fear of the Lord isn't even on the list, no matter how big the group is. Turn to Joshua 24. Now, this is a context of evangelism again. Joshua is evangelizing the nation of Israel. He suspects that their love for God is just based on getting the land and not actually on a fear of God, more just a God does wonderful things for me worship instead of true worship. And so he warns them very strong. It's a very strong gospel presentation, typical of what you see in Christ too. When Christ speaks to common sinners, he's very gracious in his gospel presentation. But when he speaks to religious people, he's very, very pointed and strong. Listen to this. Joshua 24, verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. And serve him, there's the most common worship term in Old Testament, serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. You know it's worship, okay? Stop those gods, get the right one. Fear the Lord is his call to them though. That, that's, that's his anchor concept. And it, and it gets clearer as you keep reading. Verse 15. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose whom you will serve. The gods of your fathers and the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, whatever. But as for me and my eyes, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we would forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Very ironic because they literally have idols in their tents still. 
Because it's the Lord who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt and did these great signs for us and preserved us all the way that we went, drove at all the people before us. We will serve the Lord. He is our God. And it sounds no different to what you get today where people say, we serve the Lord because he's done such wonderful things for me. <laughs> Not once in there did they say, we will serve the Lord because he was the one who appeared on Mount Sinai and made us shudder because of his holy character. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? The words of the people. But Joshua was not deceived by it. Verse 19, Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve, worship the Lord because he is a holy God. That's the piece you missed in your testimony of your love for God. Isn't that missing in Christian worship today? Holiness. It's all what God did for me. It's all God is wonderful. None of it is. God is terrifying. That's why I worship Him. God is so terrifying, I feel like I have to run away, but you can't run away to anything. It's terrifying everywhere, so it's better to just run to Him. None of us are walking, well, we should. More of us should be talking about, I worship God today because He is holy, and so I'm going to be holy. We say we worship God because I was just meditating on this verse and the song came to mind and then I read something online and it was exactly what I read early in the morning and isn't that wonderful? Oh, no, that's all wonderful, but it's all frivolous little details compared to the core of true worship. A prerequisite for true worship is a fear of God. And don't define fear as worship only. Okay, fear of God is worship. Those are synonyms. But if you define the fear of the Lord with the word worship, you're losing the fear. Because in our day, worship doesn't include terror, does it? There should be terror. Okay, remember Mount Sinai? They literally put a barricade around the foot of the mountain so that not even their goat would touch it, because it would die if it did. That's terror. It's such a fear of God that you salute to attention, and at the same time you love, it's an amazing fear, very, very different to any other fear, but you stand to attention and you obey the orders. Now, if we transition to practically how are you going to worship God this week, you're in a much better place, aren't you? You're not just thinking about your Bible reading, prayer, and meditation. You're thinking of every waking moment. Sleeping moments too. <laughs> the prerequisite for true worship is knowledge, not ignorance. Knowledge instead of ignorance. It is truth instead of sentimentality and falsehoods. It is fear of God that compels obedience, not just, I love God because he's wonderful to me. Mo Joshua told them, you have all the wonderful views of God, but you're missing the holy view of God, and therefore I'm not convinced by your commitment to true worship. You are not able. You can't do it. This is kind of the point of the law of Moses, right? You can't even keep God's law. You can't worship them. <clears throat> Later he says you're going to have to get rid of the gods that are among you. Verse 23 says, there's still idols in your tents, man. How can you say things like that? No, 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 we'll obey him. And then Joshua makes a covenant with him, basically, and says that um, you are witnesses against yourself on Judgment Day, that you said you will worship God. Something that Moses had preached on very, very clearly before. So when I say prerequisite for worship, I'm not meaning how you prepare to come to church. I'm referring to the things you need before you can even live a life acceptable to God. And that's what we want, right? A life acceptable to God. It's good for us. It's obedient to, to God. It is the highway to, to pleasing Him and all that we do. We can't do it on our own. Like, like Joshua told the people, we're going to need to be changed from within. And Christ has done that for us, so let's live differently. Um, in fact, maybe I should quickly... We've got a bit of time. Um, read this, this quote I came across this week. I sent it to the men um, apparently a long time ago. 
Listen to this. So this, this um, little quote is about corporate worship. Okay, so when you come together to worship God with all other Christians. He says, shunning regular corporate worship of God with the saints is robbing God of His honor. Anemic excuses don't justify such carnal passivity and apathy. On the contrary, the Bible condemns laziness. So don't be a pathetic sluggard. Get out of bed and go to church. Worship God. Give Him His due in light of what He has done for you. Oh, that just puts it in perspective, right? God has done things for you, and one of the things He has done for you is He hasn't immediately destroyed you for your sin. Because He's only God. That's what He normally would do. So come and give Him His due. Not just corporate worship, but in all that you do. Which brings us then to the practice of worship. Prerequisite from worship, you're going to need systematic theology. You're going to have to know your Bible. You're going to have to know truth about God. How then, does, how then do we worship? What does worship look like? The practice of worship. Again, three verses. First, turn to 1 Corinthians 6. It's perhaps the most earthly of all these verses. And therefore... A good first verse, but of shock treatment. Worship is not just your spiritual meditations. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the fact that it's Corinthians means it's going to be in the context of a lot of sin and ungodliness and chaos and disorder. And Paul's going to address the issue of worship here. And you get to chapter 6 and you realize, wait, we are just, we're in the middle of the context of sexual immorality. Exposing sexual sins. And he says this, verse 19. Or verse 18, the context, flee from sexual immorality. Verse 19. Do you not know, there's your knowledge again, that your body, that's your physical body, because it's not talking to the church as the body of Christ, your physical body, do you not know that your physical body is a temple? What happens in a temple? worship. Your body is the place of worshiping, well, the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit, so the place where you worship God. Within you, whom you have from God. God gave you the Holy Spirit. He indwells you. Therefore, to put it in terms Moses understood, take off the shoes because the ground on which you're standing is holy because God's there. Your body is where the Holy Spirit is. He indwells your body. Therefore, your body is a holy place of worship. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Do you understand what he's doing here? He's starting on the topic of sexual morality. Super practical, right? Super, super practical. And then he says, to motivate you, to live holy in, in all sexuality. Do you not know something about the Holy Spirit who is in your body? Don't you have a theology of the Christian's body and a theology of the Holy Spirit and a theology of what God has done in giving you the Holy Spirit, all systematic theology topics? Don't you have a theology of that that tells you glorify God in your physical body? You see his appeal to a few different systematic theology topics here. The practice of worship, if you at the end of the day want to say, Lord, I worship you truly today, the practice of worship is going to have to include all the activities your body did that day. Think about that. Okay? Your hand does stuff. Your head does stuff. Your feet go places. Makes you think of that little kitty song, right? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. The Father up above is looking down in holiness. <laughs> you can go through any of his attributes. So be careful what you do. So glorify God in your body. Worship is required of everything our bodies do. And you're in charge of your body. There's a one-to-one -one correlation there. Okay? You're the only one in charge of your body. So glorify God in it. When you stand up, when you sit down. Remember 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 later in the same book. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Exactly the same concept. Everything your body does. 
Turn to Matthew 23 for another practice of worship that we need to keep in mind. These are all big category issues. Everything your body does, and then also everything God says and nothing else. Nothing else. Listen to this statement by Jesus. Matthew 23, verse 8. But you are not to be called rabbi or teacher, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. So he's talking in the context of the Pharisees who like the titles. And uh, so if I walk in, you have to call me pastor, and uh, because I'm your pastor and you're the sheep. He says, no, 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 no. That's, we, we've got to kill that very, very quickly. So all of you still call me pastor. I heard it a few times this morning. Um, Christ is our teacher. We are just brothers and sisters in Christ. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. That doesn't mean you can't go to your physical dad and say father. He's talking about spiritual people, or people who are spiritually placing themselves above you. So if your earthly father is doing that to you spiritually, then don't call him father. Then it's relevant. For you have one father who is in heaven, and the implication is, and the rest of you are all on earth. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servants. A very, very neglected verse in modern Christianity, obviously. What's the point here? The point is, when it comes to spiritual realities, worship, you have to include everything your physical body does. That's going to be worship. But you also have to make sure that you're doing what God says and not anyone else. We live, sadly, in a country where the anointed man of God kind of nonsense in churches is so prevalent. And people are worshiping falsely because they're following someone other than Christ be it in a famous denominational historical way like the Roman Catholic Church that says the Pope is more to be trusted than even the Scriptures, or be it your local pastor who raises himself up as a man of God who has to be esteemed, keeps you ignorant of the Scriptures, so you just have to believe what he says. Either way, you're a false worshiper. You don't go to heaven because you listen to somebody talk about God. You go to heaven because you got right with God himself. You listen to what he said. You do what he said. Keep that in mind. I, I would hate for anyone of us to come through a practical theology class and live, no, or live just as godly as you perhaps ever were, but you're doing it because the pastor said so, or because my wife is watching, or because my kids need a good example. That's not true worship. True worship, the practice of worship is at every given moment saying, what does God teach on this issue? What does God say about it? Oh, it's the most liberating question to ask in everything. Can you read some nonsense news article about how people are still confused about men and women? And, and simply by saying, what does God say about the topic? You solve it. <laughs> and now you can live differently. And you will worship better that day because you have clarity on the topic that's confusing everyone else. And now when you talk to somebody about those issues who's completely entrenched in the nonsense, well, God has something to say about how you talk to people as well. In fact, it's our closing verse in our systematic theology classes. Being able to give an answer for the hope that it was within you with meekness and patience. So the practice of worship includes all the physical things your physical body does that you are in charge of, obviously. The practice of worship includes doing what God says and not trusting anyone else to define true worship. Don't have meetings on how worship, what worship should look like in the church. Preach what worship should look like in the church. Declare it. And then I said we're going to go to Psalm 99. Turn there. The Psalm of Worship, the first time I preached Psalm 99. I had a, I had a great sermon outline, but 
it didn't exactly reflect the sections in the psalm. I think I had three points or whatever it was. And point one was verse one and the second half of verse five and verse seven or whatever. And point two was, it's all mixed up in Psalm 99. It's just like one big jumble of concepts regarding worship. To tie it into the knowledge just quickly, look how it begins. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. Now there's a call for worship. Okay, where's Trayton when you need him? Okay, that's how we're going to have our next call for worship. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. Look at the echo, though, of the psalm, verse 3. Holy is He. Verse 5. Holy is He. Verse 9. For the Lord our God is holy. Okay, it's a psalm of true worship, isn't it? Knowledge of God compared to who you are, and then specifically focusing on the fact that he's terrifying. He's holy. Look at verse 5, though, perhaps the, the summary of the entire psalm, certainly the echo of it. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. The Lord reigns. He's up there. Let the people tremble. They're down here. Exalt God. Make God very big in your understanding of Him. And then come and worship as lowly as you can. It's not like God is glorious and wonderful and we can attain that greatness by declaring wonderful words of worship. No, the Lord is great and glorious and we're going to come and kind of grovel at His feet amazed by the fact that he would even accept us at that level. The practice of worship, then, if you want to summarize it simply, it's, we're obviously oversimplifying, but we need that, is worship God with everything you do. Not just the music at church, not just church. Everything your body does. Worship God practically by trusting what he says don't trust anyone else. And then worship God by making sure everything you do raises your understanding of Him and lowers your view of yourself. Somebody was once asked, how do you discern when you walk into a church whether it's a good or bad church? Now that's a very pertinent question, a very important one, okay? The, the answer he gave, though, was, was brilliantly practical. He says, see if God or man is the most important person in the service. Well, obviously God's going to be the most important person. He says, yeah, but just watch. Do people leave built up in themselves or do they leave amazed that God and his greatness would even consider them? Okay, you don't have to walk with serious conviction out of every church service, but you do have to walk out recognizing you and God are not on the same playing ground. Okay, we, he, he's just in a different category. We, you, you, you never get there. We're not on the same level at all, and we'll never be. Even in heaven, when we're glorified and made perfect, we're still not going to be God. We're still going to be human creatures. We're still going to show up to his throne room in Jerusalem and tremble when we get in, instead of saying, oh, yes, we're one of you. <laughs> The word holiness there we often think of in terms of not sinning is pure. But its definition is a little more precise. The moral holiness of God is more a, a consequence of the pure definition of holiness. Holiness simply means completely set apart. Completely set apart. Not just separated, taken and put far away from everything else. Okay, in a category of its own. Exalt the Lord... Worship at his footstool because God is set apart. Now that's again knowledge or truth about God, but it's a practical knowledge. Because when you read the Bible and you read through tomorrow morning through Philippians chapter 4 of how God supplies in all our needs, how wonderful and gracious he is, you are going to worship falsely if you pray at the end and say, thank you God that you take care of me so much. Thank you that I mean so much to you. You're going to be worshiping truly, though, if you at the end of it say, thank you, Lord, for taking care of me so much. Uh, you're incredibly gracious to care for somebody like me and all my physical needs. Do you see the difference? Oh, it's so subtle, and yet it's miles apart. 
So, practice of worship, everything you do, not just the music at church, it has to be done based on God's view and instructions on things, and that alone. And then it has to make God great and you not. <laughs> then you're worshiping practically in all you do. There is a, a song written in church history. Oh, is there a, don't read that just yet. Listen to me first. We'll read it together just now. You'll get everything that's on there. Don't worry. Um, a song of true worship. I was trying to think what song would be good to, to focus on worship. And this is perhaps the most practical of the ones I could think of. And I, and I browsed through a, a very serious thick hymnal even to find some things. This song, Take My Life and Let It Be, you know it, right? Was written by a lady called Francine, Francis Ridley Havergal, 1836. She was born, she wrote this in 1874. So what's it now? 150 years ago? Something like that. Uh, she was born in the UK, the Midlands of the UK, to a pastor, in a pastor's home, to a pastor and his wife. She was a bit of an intellectual genius. She very quickly learned a number of different languages. She tr um, traveled to Switzerland quite often, so pretty much all the languages between England and Switzerland she learned. She also learned Hebrew and Greek to be able to study the scriptures in their original languages. Um, I should tell my kids, I was very typical of pastor's kids back then. <laughs> She, though, personally had a very keen interest in missions, uh, very interested in distant missions. She's, I want people to go and tell people about Christ, especially those who never heard the gospel. About her own conversion, she simply said this. She says, I committed my soul to the Savior, and earth and heaven seemed brighter from that moment. Uh, just testifying to how the, the knowledge, saving knowledge of God opens your eyes to everything that's going on around you. In any case, she wrote many songs. She wrote more than 70, 70 hymns. And to put it in perspective, she died at the age of 43, 42, just before her 43rd birthday. At the age of 42, she had written 70 hymns already, this perhaps being one of the most famous ones. She died in Wales, as I said, or at age 42, as I said. So let's read Oh, I'll read it. You can just follow along. I'm going to read this song, and I've shortened it a bit. Um, I took out the repetition that was part of the, the musical structure. And just read it as prose. Okay, forget the poetry. Let's just read it as a poetic non-poem, as prose. And understand from her perspective what true worship looked like in her life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Consecrated is the same word as holy, okay? Set apart. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. How's that, eh? I, I want, my hands should worship you. Make sure your love is the impulse and not my heart, my sinful heart. Take my feet, let them be very swift and beautiful for thee. That's a reference to missions, actually, in Romans 10. Take my voice and let me sing always, only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Okay, I want to speak Your words, and when I use my lips to praise You, I want them to, to sing to You. I want them to exalt You, not just mumble, okay? Sing, exaltation, only for You, not to anyone else. I'm not singing here to be heard by the music team or my neighbor or anything like that, or just love the sound of a full house singing. No, I'm singing only for my King. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite, that's the smallest coin, would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you will choose. And she had a substantial power of intellect. <laughs> Take my will. That's not your will and testament when you die. That's your volition, okay? The things you decide to do. Take my will and make it thine. It will be no longer mine. How's that for not my will but yours be done? Rephrased. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. She understood her body was a temple of the Holy Spirit. She looked at her heart and says, that's, that's where you sit and rule. Okay, so it's yours. If you want to take it at age 42, so be it. 
Take my love, my Lord. I pour at thy feet its treasure store. So she, she, she pictures her love as this, this wonderful storage of beautiful treasures. And she says, I'm just going to pour it all out in worship to you. Now, that's your more sentimental, mystical side to worship, which is certainly part of true worship. But this is after going through all the physical things that are also going to describe her worship. And then as a bit of a, a collective summary, she says, Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Sounds a little bit like that phrase in court, right? I'm going to say all the truth and nothing but the truth. Only the truth, all the truth, nothing but the truth. It's ever. Okay, so no time is allocated for me, myself, and I. It's only. So there's exclusivity. It doesn't go to anyone else. All for thee. Every part gets involved. All the time, only for Christ, with everything I have for thee. That is perhaps one of the most practical songs ever written on the topic of worship. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to echo what we just read from Francis Havergal. And Lord, it's, it's merely restating what you have so clearly revealed in Scripture in just a beautiful, poetic, concise way. Lord, teach us to worship this week not only in our, our commitment and words to do so. We're Christians, of course, we worship you, but in everything we do with all of us. Lord, when we speak to our, our spouses, when we parent our kids, when we engage with our parents, when we go to work, when we have attitudes while driving, when we calm down at the end of the day when we sit on our bed and can't fall asleep, whatever it might be, when we, we watch entertainment, when we engage in whatever we do, activity of this week, Lord, whatever it is, may we first ask ourselves, what do you say about it? May we then fear your holiness and may we then act accordingly. Lord, forgive us for act, living like atheists while we claim to worship you. Forgive us for our sins and Lord, cleanse us from unrighteousness so we too can be holy, set apart to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.